By 1974, George is already known all over the world from being in the Beatles. He's proven himself as a songwriter on albums like The White Album and Abbey Road. He's skyrocketed into superstardom with All Things Must Pass. He's organized the legendary concert for Bangladesh, and he's bore his soul into his sophomore release, Living in the Material World. There was no doubt in anyone's mind that George Harrison was a force to be reckoned with, maybe even more so than John and Paul. Though by 1973, his former bandmates were starting to find their solo voices with Mind Games and Band on the Run, respectively. Even Ringo had huge success with his album, appropriately titled Ringo. George co-wrote a number one single for this album, Photograph, and even joined a partial Beatles reunion with Ringo and John Lennon on the song I Am The Greatest. Paul would also contribute Six O'Clock, but without John or George's involvement. Since George was a believer in yin and yang, what goes up? must come down. Dark Horse, a term that would later be synonymous with George's record releases, is appropriately titled because it captures a very dark period in his life. His relationship to Patty Boyd was failing due to his infidelity and massive drug use. And indeed, the paradox of his spiritual journey and rock star status explored on Material World were starting to weigh heavily on him. While he was working on this album, George also embarked on a North American tour with Ravi Shankar. His band included Billy Preston, Andy Newmark, Willie Weeks, Jim Horn, even Robin Ford. Unfortunately, George was suffering from massive laryngitis. And I don't think mixing alcohol with coke was helping much either. That one tour in 74, which apart from almost killing myself with fatigue, I quite enjoyed. I didn't have a voice at the time, though. A running joke surrounding this period was to spell Dark Horse as H-O-A-R-S-E. So this tour was panned hard by the critics. Actually, the audience response to it was great. But by the time I came back to England and I saw a few things in the papers, I said to somebody, I get the feeling that it didn't go down well. He said, oh no, it was the biggest disaster you've ever done in your life. And the album, which was released in the middle of the tour, didn't fare any better. If you listen to the single, it's almost impossible not to focus on how damaged his voice sounds. And even his voice aside, Dark Horse has never been one of my favorite tunes. It's clear that George was very passionate about this tune, even though it's basically about him being an unfaithful husband. And I just thought of Dark Horse running on a dark race course, thought, ha, ah, sounds like a song. I know some fans swear by this song, but I just don't feel like it goes anywhere. And that's this record in a nutshell. Are there good songs on it? Well, yeah, there are. I actually really enjoy the opening number, Harry's on Tour, which would also kick off his live shows at the time. This is called Harry's on Tour Express. It's fun to hear an instrumental. You don't hear them often in Harrison's catalog. I also dig Maya Love, a real funky number thanks to Billy Preston's piano riffs and some cool slide on George's part. I, love I also like that it continues the tradition of exploring Hindu philosophy, referring to romantic relationships in and of themselves as Maya, which was probably fresh in George's mind given his separation from Patty. I think those two tunes are the best on the album and were the additions to George Harrison's catalog, though I wouldn't say they leave the same impact as anything off of the previous two albums. Some of the other songs are okay, Simply Shady, which has some cool guitar licks from Robin Ford, and So Sad, tell the story of George's naughty period, as he called it. Far East Man was actually a collaboration between George and future Rolling Stone guitarist Ronnie Wood. He's a Far East Man! who, ironically, was having an affair with Patty at the time. Man, talk about a musical soap opera. I do kinda dig this tune, even if it goes on too long. I actually prefer the version of Ronnie Wood's album. George plays some pretty sweet slide licks. I did um, the perverted version of uh, Bye Bye Love. Yeah, I'm definitely not a fan of George's rearranged version of the Everly Brothers song. In fact, he changed a lot of lyrics to even his own songs on the 74 tour. By my guitar tries to smile The one song where his hoarse voice really bothers me is the other single, Ding Dong. Whereas the scratchy voice kinda works on Simply Shady or Dark Horse, given the lyrical content, here it's just rough to listen to. Bring out the false, the truth. And 
that's a shame because I can tell George really wanted this to be a standout track. In fact, they should replace whatever old Lang Syne with Ding Dong. I think this might actually be his worst vocal performance. I mean, the whole album is really. I can definitely see why Dark Horse was panned hard by the critics. At its best, these songs are just okay, especially coming from the same guy who gave us All Things Must Pass. I'll admit a few listens later, the album has grown on me a little bit. It does have some funky grooves, some interesting lyrical ideas, and it's not nearly as bad as some of his other albums, which we'll get to later. Still, I can't necessarily recommend this album, so I'm gonna give it a spotted fish. Worth a listen on streaming if you're a George fan, but not worth buying. The essential track, for me at least, is the opener, Harry's On Tour. Also check out Maya Love, Far East Man, the version on Ron Wood's album if you can, and I guess Dark Horse, as a lot of fans really like that single. Maybe you like the record. Comment below and let me know your thoughts. Well, this is the first roadblock we've hit in George Harrison's catalog. Can he redeem himself on the next release, Extra Texture? Catch me next time.